All right. Uh, good evening. This is the February 1st, uh, 2023 Cottage Grove City Council meeting, which I'm calling to order. Uh, the first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you'd please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, will the uh, clerk please do the roll? Councilmember Kambada? Present. Councilmember Dennis? Here. Councilmember Thede? Here. Councilmember Olson? Here. Mayor Bailey? Here. Uh, next on our agenda is open forum. This is the opportunity for anybody who wants to speak on something that is not on tonight's agenda is welcome to do so. Uh, we did have a sign up sheet on the entryway, but nobody did sign up. So in the event that somebody came in that wants to speak uh, but forgot to sign up or didn't see it, anybody want to speak on open forum? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and close open form, and I'll move to number five, which is adoption of the agenda. Motion to adapt the agenda. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Dennis, seconded by Councilmember Thede. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next is presentations. We do have one this evening. Uh, the uh, presentation this evening is the Public Safety Board check presentation, and I believe um, our uh, community service officer, that's what we're calling you now? Community engagement, <laughs> Community engagement officer, sorry. I did get the wrong one. Uh, Dan Schoen is going to uh, kick us off here. And then I would ask council and the uh, uh, public safety board to come on up to the front. Mr. Mayor, as, uh, as mayor, you get to call me whatever you want. <laughs> so that works for me. Don't call me later for dinner. Right. Well, as we assemble, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council, in 1995, a group of civic-minded individuals with the goal of a safer Cottage Grove came together with our then public safety officials and formed a nonprofit organization now known as the Cottage Grove Public Safety Board. Individuals have changed over the years, but the goal of doing their part to help their fellow community members remains constant. In 2022, you all, as the council and mayor, made an investment in our community by adding another police canine to our staff. We know this investment takes great planning and the results of having a canine team available can literally be the difference between life and death when it comes to tracking down lost children, vulnerable adults, or violent suspects our society is seeing more and more of. The Public Safety Board, as our nonprofit partner, is here to donate a check for $10,000 specifically for the new canine. Officer Sorgard here to my left is our newest canine handler and believe it or not, he will likely receive his uh, new partner this weekend. Uh, the lead trainer from Washington County will be working with, will be in Florida tomorrow, and will work with Sergeant Torning, and they probably get on FaceTime and, and have a conversation about how is the mannerisms of the dog, because they do have personalities, and how will that dog fit into our department and best serve our community needs. It is hard to believe, since the Public Safety Board has been actively supporting the canine program, that this is now the fourth canine they financially supported, starting with Officer Mike Vandervoort and Canine Blitz, Sergeant Torning, and uh, Canine Gunner, who Mr. Mayor in your comments earlier noted that Gunner will be retiring by the end of this year. Officer Brandon Graff uh, and his Canine Scout. Uh, we didn't bring Scout in the council chambers, but Brandon's out here. We're, we're gonna, we're, we'll leave uh, Scout. Scout still stays in the car <laughs> until we need him, and that's all right. And then Officer Sorgard and soon to be named. So uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you so much for your dedication to us. And thank you uh, on behalf of the Cottage Grove Police Department. I know Chief Kerner wishes he could be here tonight, but he's with family tonight, as many of you know. And uh, thank you. So there we go. All right, so let's give them a round of applause, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to say, you know, from our standpoint on the uh, Cottage Grove City Council and the staff and obviously all the citizens of Cottage Grove, thank you uh, for, the, for the generous donation. And uh, Nils, thank you for uh, being, the, being the leader here on some of this stuff here. He's doing pretty good over there until I come over by him. <laughs> so, uh, Cindy, did you want to speak on this? Julie? Julie, I'm sorry. I'm looking at my wife and I'm looking at you. That's okay. Um, yes. We have supported buy-in or supporting buy-in of 
a canine dog for the last four times. And we can't do that without fundraising. And LSP Electric is one of our biggest donors. And we also try to do a golf tournament. And February 19th, it's a Sunday afternoon, I'm going to plug it. We're doing a bunco tournament at the St. Paul Park Legion. It costs $10, and all that money will be going into the Public Safety Board. So come on down, have some fun. Either you play with us or you don't. You can observe, but it's all fun, and you don't have to have any experience. So thank you. And I should just mention, obviously, we're here tonight to uh, uh, thank you for this uh, amazing gift for the, our next police dog. But they also, the, the donations that you guys have been doing go to traffic, uh, speed signs, and all the different things that happen within our community. So this is just one uh, part of a bigger picture that you guys provide for uh, our public safety department here. So again, on behalf of everybody here, thank you. Awesome. One more round of applause. And the fire department. Sure. Here, take yep. the check. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's perfect. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Drop it just a tiny bit. Perfect. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, everybody. He must be a little bit rambunctious. Huh? He's very rambunctious. Only aggressive. <laughs> All right. Uh, next on our agenda this evening is consent calendar. Uh, Council, is there anything like to pull on consent? Council Member Dennis? Mayor, I'd like to pull item E. Item E, okay. Council, anything else? Nope. All right, seeing none, uh, item E, uh, Council Member Dennis is accepting some donations. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor. And, you know, this is something that we like to do as a uh, council um, every quarter, take a moment to uh, recognize the generosity of our community uh, relative to helping to fund some amazing things here within the city of Cottage Grove. So for this period, which ran between October 1st, 2022 and December 31st, 2022, it's my privilege tonight to recognize the Stantec Consulting Services Company uh, who donated $2,100 to the hometown holiday celebration and also uh, the Cottage Grove Athletic Association who donated a substantial amount. Um, looking to me here with some quick math, uh, about $35,000, $36,000 in totality uh, for everything from scoreboard uh, power hookups, uh, park rink boards and scoreboards, black netting, and other equipment um, relative to uh, helping with football and soccer field renovations. So uh, those things are absolutely fantastic and we're grateful for that opportunity and we recognize those, um, those uh, organizations for that. And as I always like to do every time that we talk about this is that uh, if anyone ever wants to make a difference and we had a chance to see here just a moment ago the um, Public Safety Board um, who through numerous um, uh, folks that donate money into causes. Um, if you want to make a difference, we certainly won't say no. Uh, we'll be very grateful to accept any donation amount that you may have. No donation is too big or too small. Every dollar makes a difference and helps to make our home be a better place. So that's what I have, Mayor. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. With nothing else being pulled on consent, I guess I'll look for a motion. Move consent. Uh, motion by uh, to approve consent by Councilman Rathidi, seconded by Councilman Rolson. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So if you happen to be here for anything on tonight's consent calendar, all of those items have been approved. Uh, number eight is approved disbursement. 8A is to pay the bills. Motion to pay the bills. Uh, motion by Councilmember Dennis. Second. Second by Councilmember Kambada. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Number nine is public hearings. We do have one this evening. Uh, we do have the 2023 pavement management uh, project. Uh, we're holding a um, hearing, uh, possibly ordering the project, authorizing preps and plans and all that other fun stuff. Uh, and our uh, uh, public works director, Ryan Burfine, is going to walk us through this. So welcome, Ryan. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council for the public hearing tonight. I'm gonna to start off with a presentation on the project where I'll talk about um, the specific project area, what kind of improvements we're proposing, and also take a look at the proposed assessments. I'll mention that we did have a neighborhood meeting for this project on January 12th here at City Hall. We had 11 households in attendance at that meeting, and we gave a very similar presentation to what I'll be giving tonight. Uh, when we look at pavement management or just pavement rehab methods, really, there's a variety of things that the city has done over the years. Um, first, which is really just maintenance procedures, seal coat, crack seal, uh, those are things that we do on an annual basis on our roads in town just to keep them and maintain them in good working order. Uh, we have mill and overlay projects where we take off that top inch and a half to two inches of the pavement, put it back down, and really don't do much else. We don't do a lot of utility work or other improvements uh, in a neighborhood. Uh, tonight, talking about a pavement replacement project, that's what we have before you. And then reconstruction is when you have that total reconstruction, the whole roadway from the subgrade all the way on up is replaced. Uh, so much more intensive project. Uh, why do pavement management? So it does keep our roads in good condition, right? Good drivable, uh, safe operating condition, uh, maintains it in good working order, and also it does maintain property values. Uh, we know that having good streets, good infrastructure in a neighborhood um, is beneficial to that neighborhood. Uh, we look at the history of pavement management. I got a map on the screen here. There's a lot of information, but really it's just meant to depict. We've been doing this for a long time. Uh, we've done uh, a lot of the neighborhoods in the city uh, throughout the years, starting in the 90s. And we think about a 25 to 30 year life cycle of the roadways. You really got to work your way around the town um, in that life cycle and kind of continue on um, as the city continues to age. <clears throat> Looking at this project area specifically, uh, it's on the north is 80th Street. Uh, east side of the project is Hyde Avenue, 83rd Street, and then it's everything north of Hillside Trail. Uh, years constructed of the actual uh, pavement in this neighborhood, uh, mostly 1996. It was a pavement management project in 1996, so here we are, you know, 27 years later, right in that 25 to 30 year time frame that we're looking for um, to redo that pavement section. A little bit was 1998 as well. Um, but the actual neighborhood was constructed in 1963 and 1966. So uh, about 60 years old. So the utilities are 60 years old. And that is reflected in the project because we do have more <coughs> utility work uh, than maybe we've seen in past projects in the last <coughs> five to eight years. Looking at the roadway condition, uh, the city does a PACER rating is what it's called. Uh, we rate all our roadways on a scale of one to 10. Um, all the streets in this neighborhood are between a, a three to five. So definitely in that realm of needing that pavement replacement. Um, it's not a total reconstruction project, um, but definitely you know, meets the, the needs of a pavement replacement. Uh, we do core samples throughout the project areas. We do this for a few different reasons. We just wanna make sure that the pavement thickness is what we're expecting. Um, also, we're looking at you know, issues with the pavement, and a lot of this area has been what we call asphalt stripping, where that top starts at the top and works its way down. Pavement section really dries out and starts to peel off. Actually, nine years ago, uh, Public Works did do a thin overlay on each side because it really starts on the edges of the roadway. Um, so that, that thin overlay has really seen its full useful life. We typically say no more than seven years. We've stretched a few more years out of it. And you can see that with all the patching that we've been doing. Looking at the existing conditions, uh, we have uh, the 80th Street frontage road uh, in these pictures. <clears throat> you can see a lot of the uh, the failure around the manholes, that's been pretty consistent throughout the neighborhood, a lot of patching. And on the right, just a lot of that spot patching uh, throughout the neighborhood from all the asphalt stripping. Uh, these pictures here, we've got Hemingway Avenue, Hyde Court, just a, a lot of patching of the roadway, a lot of cracking. And you can see that <clears throat> condition of the those thin overlays on the edge where there's actually additional pothole patching taking place in those thin overlays. Uh, here we've got Homestead Avenue, Hornell Avenue, uh, a lot of the same, a lot of cracking, uh, asphalt stripping, pavement patching throughout the neighborhood. Uh, and Hyde Avenue, uh, some good example of some really severe alligator cracking uh, in the neighborhood, and then more failure on Hemingway Avenue around the manhole section. Uh, finally, on Hemingway Avenue, Henslow Avenue, uh, very similar, uh, just really continuous patching by the public works crews uh, in this neighborhood over the last several years just to keep it in you know, drivable condition. I mentioned the utilities. They're getting quite old in this neighborhood. Uh, we did do our, our typical utility inspections. Uh, we inspected all the manhole structures, televised all the pipes. You know, overall, we found that they're in good condition in terms of we don't need any full replacements. There's no full water main replacements, no full sewer replacements required, which can happen when you get to utilities of this age. Um, but there is a lot of maintenance needed. A lot of manholes need to be patched, rebuilt, and really fully replaced. Uh, and also, 
the Ys, that's where the service comes into the line. Uh, a lot of cracking of that and a lot of the cracking of the pipe section. So we'll have a lot of um, trenchless work where we actually put a liner in the pipe um, to fix that cracking that's occurred in the sanitary sewer. Uh, for water main, like I said, we have had some water main breaks. They haven't been frequent enough to justify any full water main replacements, um, but we are gonna be fixing the, the valve bolts and then the fittings uh, in the area. <coughs> Uh, the proposed improvement. So it is a full pavement replacement, which has been pretty typical for our projects in the past several years. Uh, spot curb replacement, about 15% of the curb that we're looking at removing and replacing based on what our inspection showed. And then minor utility repairs. Uh, in addition to the ones I mentioned, we also have some street light wire to replace. Uh, we've had one street that's just had a lot of street light issues and we know that wire, uh, it's just buried in the ground wire. We're gonna put that in conduit uh, so we don't have those issues in the future. Um, and then hydrant reconditioning. So we actually sandblast and repaint those hydrants to make sure that they you know, get the whole useful life out of them. As far as the estimated assessments goes, uh, there's 308 uh, residential buildable lot equivalents, which is a big word. It's really a single family home um, is what it is for this neighborhood. Um, and we do a special benefit appraisal, it's called. So we actually hire a third party special benefit appraiser just to verify that the assessment that we are proposing is you know, no more than that special benefit that the, that the homes receive. Uh, the special benefit appraisals came back between $58 and $7,100. And our proposed assessment per our policy is just under $5,000, so $4,965. And the way that's calculated, it's 45% of all the assessable costs in the project um, are divided among those benefiting properties. So uh, the special benefit appraisal does support that assessment. Uh, if uh, assessment was approved uh, at the end of the project and, and paid over 15 years, it's about $467 per year. Uh, in terms of religious institutions, there is one church in the area and uh, the uh, assessment per policy is about 43,000. Um, but in this case, and we do see this with churches, I think pretty commonly that the special benefit was 21,900. So the assessment would be capped at that amount if the assessments didn't move ahead at the end of the project. Here's just a quick map again. Uh, all the areas in green is all the single family homes. Then there's the one church on Hyde, uh, Hyde Avenue. Quick funding breakdown. Uh, the project's just a little over $4 million. You can see the variety of utility funds that we'll be using for a lot of those improvements. Uh, general levy, you know, I mentioned 50 or 45% is assessed. The other 55% um, is picked up by the general levy. Um, and those assessments are just over $1.5 million estimated at this time. Uh, the assessment terms um, and, and just talking schedule and for the folks in the audience, you know, tonight is a public hearing. Um, so it's not about the assessment at this time. It's really about the need for the project and ordering the project. Um, if the project does move ahead, there would be assessment hearing at the end of the project where we actually use the actual project cost. So uh, we don't want to base an assessment on an estimate. We want to know what the real numbers are. So if we do see some savings, the savings are passed on the assessment. Um, but if the project did move ahead and there was an assessment next fall, uh, the charges, uh, it could be paid within 30 days to avoid any interest charges. Otherwise, it goes on the taxes, it's payable over 15 years. Um, and the interest rate is 1.5% above the bond rate. And right now, um, working with uh, Ellers, it, it looks like a bond rate would be about 3.5% is what it would be. Uh, partial payment is allowed, a uh, minimum of $500. Um, but if the project is ordered tonight, there would be a pending assessment listed uh, on all the properties. Uh, also, deferral is available. Uh, that's for disability, military, and 65 years of age or older. Uh, proof is needed for that and interest still accrues during that deferral period. If people have more questions on that, they can always reach out to our finance department to get that information. Quickly looking at a schedule. So the feasibility report was ordered on October 5th, uh, and that was approved on January 4th. Uh, like I mentioned, we had the neighborhood meeting on January 12th. Uh, here we are tonight for public hearing, February 1st. And if the project is ordered, we'd have construction start in the spring of 2023, uh, complete in September, and then we would uh, anticipate a public hearing in October. Uh, and with that, uh, the recommendations are on the screen before you, and I'll be happy to stand for any questions. Okay. Uh, Council Member Dennis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and Ryan, thank you for that, uh, for that thorough, thorough overview of this uh, particular project. You know, I, I, I can't believe what I'm about to say here, but um, 29 years ago, 
uh, back in 1994, I had a chance to volunteer um, as a, uh, just a private citizen to the city on something called the Pavement Management Task Force. And um, I, I bring that up because I saw in one of your slides you had indicated that um, one of the very early projects was in 1995. Mm -hmm. So what had happened is um, I joined with a, a number of different volunteers um, from the community, worked with the staff team that was present at that time and a consultant. And what we sought to do was to create a process that would allow us to effectively manage um, all of the miles of roadway that we had here. And when we talk about managing, we're talking about making sure that we have, you know, a great surface for people to drive on, one that's safe, one that's secure, um, one that takes into account the fact that the community through our taxes have paid for that infrastructure and that's an asset to the community. So that's a, a very important point to remember. So we mapped out a process that would, in essence, allow us to um, go through and work different zones in the city based upon location and date and of course wear and tear on the roadway systems that we had so that we could do this and, and protect our asset for the community and do it in pieces that we're able to get our arms around and actually maintain the operation of, of paying for that. Um, if, you, if you look at places like the city of St. Paul, they've kicked those cans down the road so far that um, they're having some real major problems there as far as being able to uh, step out in front and do what's necessary to make that difference. So for us, um, having this process in place, and, and you took the time to show some of the slides, um, one of the um, pictures that you presented for people were the core samples. And so just so people are aware, when, when we go through and analyze an area, there's some real science that goes into this. And so with the core samples, one of the things that you want to make sure is that we've got proper adhesion between the bituminous material and the aggregate and the sand and other pieces that come together to make a solid roadway system. So when we pull these core samples out, if you pull it out and the thing crumbles, that indicates that that adhesion was lost. And that would be a total reconstruction at that right. point. So one of the things, um, just for folks to know and understand, we live in a very difficult climate here in Minnesota. Um, we get quite warm in the summertime, very cold in the winter. Um, we have a lot of liquid. Uh, water is gonna be the, the enemy of any roadway system, which is why it's always important for us to maintain good quality over our curb and gutter systems to channel that water away um, so that we're not getting degradation to the process. So um, every year, as mentioned, 55% um, of any maintenance uh, cost, operation cost relative to this is borne by the community as a whole. Every once in a while, what ends up happening is it comes to the homeowner. I know both myself and the mayor had this back in 2013 when our neighborhoods respectively um, had to have an upgrade and maintenance performed. So um, I just wanted to take the moment to um, share with the community to know that um, uh, in the past I had an opportunity to serve and be part of this and, and learn about things like the alligatoring and, and the stripping and all this stuff. It, it's, it's such a cool thing, you never forget it. And uh, so I'm grateful that I did, but, um, but I, I understand the challenges relative. It, there's a cost factor involved, um, we understand that. Um, but from time to time, we have to take care of the process and make sure that we're maintaining the structure of our roads so that our community does not lose that investment over time. So I appreciate um, your time and hope my, my little bit of information that I can add into this um, helps to make a difference for, for people that are watching and want to learn a little bit about the process. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilman Brolson. Thanks for the information, Ryan. Um, not my first time going through this, so um, you know it certainly is uh, encouraging to hear that um, we continue to place a, a strong emphasis on the asset of our roadways here in the city of Cottage Grove. A couple of things I wanted to ask you about, um, and if any of these are things that you don't want to deal with, just kick them over to the city administrator, the attorney. Um, first of all, you mentioned that the age of this roadway is approximately 27 years. Is that accurate? Correct, yep. Okay. So what do you find to be the average useful life of uh, an area like this with respect to you know the roadways? I'd say, uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Olson, 25 to 30 years, you know, that's really what we're looking for. Um, if we can get 25 years out of it, I think we're pretty happy. Some have gone a few more years. Sure, and is this one of the neighborhoods where 
um, 27 years ago when we uh, addressed this same issue. Um, we had the, the uh, issue with MnDOT and their, their asphalt specs. Is, is this one of those neighborhoods that experienced that where the asphalt was a little bit too dry? <clears throat> yep, Mr. Mayor, Councilman Rolston. So that, that goes back to that asphalt stripping, yeah. which there's been a lot of research on. And that is you know, one of the, uh, I'd say, outcomes of that research is that there were some changes made. It really went 90s into 2000s, not just in Cottage Grove, but right. really statewide. Um, where there was a little bit less oil in the mix, which kind of had that, that stripping asphalt uh, issue come out a little bit earlier. Um, but it's always hard with asphalt because it's, it's an empirical thing and it's, it's, um, there's a lot of testing and whatnot. And you don't always see what is happening until far down the road, which is where we are now. Right. Um, but yep, this is one of those neighborhoods um, that we do have in town. The reason I asked is I do know that statewide there have been challenges. Um, and if, if you just look to our neighbor the, to the north, um, you know, they've got far more miles of this asphalt than, than we do. <clears throat> and of course, what people uh, may not know about these projects is we have to adhere to those MnDOT specifications as it relates to the product that we put down on the roadways. And I know at that time there was some conversation about, you know, how do we recycle some of the asphalt as opposed to just having everything be all brand new. And, and that led to... Um, number of communities across the state saying, hey, wait a minute, um, this, this roadway isn't lasting quite as long as we would like, and that's probably why we did that thin overlay, was to make that last. Yep. Now, something else that I know that you've been doing since you became our uh, city engineer and our public works director is <clears throat> you've kind of changed the way that we manage our, our asphalt. Um, not only are we doing these kind of projects, but we're also doing mill and overlay projects. Can you just tell us a little bit about how that works and, and what the result is in terms of increasing the useful life of a roadway? Yep, Mr. Mayor, Councilman Rolson. So that is uh, a new project that we started uh, two years ago up in the Timber Ridge neighborhood where we do that mill and overlay. And you know some cities do a mill and overlay where you do the mill and overlay, take that top layer off and put it back down. But then they're doing all the utility work and different things. This is really just a pavement um, preservation type thing where we're just doing that mill and overlay very low cost and we, we have started doing those um, about four to five maybe six miles of roadway per year uh, we are hoping to um, extend that full life right and it's going to take a whole life cycle of roadways to do that but you know get it out to that 35 to 40 year mark is our goal um, but it does like I said it's going to take that whole life cycle of a roadway to, to see that um, benefit but we want to think long term right want to think long term and make sure we're getting the best benefit for the city. So then what I think I hear you saying, tell me if I'm wrong, is you know, we're gonna get this roadway back up to the condition it should be in 2023. And then at some point, they'll be eligible for that mill and overlay, which we do at, at no cost to the homeowner. There's no assessment. It's all borne by the, by the taxpayers in the city. So then this roadway, which we're addressing 27 years, you know, into the future from when it was first done, um, we might see 40 years-ish. Does that sound about right? Yep, Mr. Mayor, Councilman Rolston, I think if, if uh, the way we're planning this and operating it, that's, that's what we're hoping for. Good. Um, is, is these roads going forward. Good. And, and, and I like hearing that because, of course, assessments are tough on everybody. But assessments are also a, a legal process here in the state of Minnesota. And this is where you might want to shoot the puck over to the attorney. Um, to talk a little bit about how the process works from a legal perspective. We actually have legal guidelines we have to follow. Could, could you just maybe touch on that briefly? Uh, certainly, Your Honor, members of the council and council member Olson, uh, this is the one of the public hearings that we have to hold in order to order the project. So this is really to determine whether or not the public wants you to do this road. Mm -hmm. um, the Obviously, one of the outcomes is that there's an assessment at the end, which is the second public hearing that we hold. So. If this passes tonight and you order the project, uh, then at the end of the day, when the assessments uh, are, are before you, it will be a public hearing again. And so the public will have an opportunity to tell you that they agree or don't agree with the assessments. And if even if you adopt the assessments, there's an appeal process mm -hmm. that they can pursue. And so the statute carries or uh, explains that they have 30 days from the date of the assessment to appeal it to the district court. So their due process rights are, are fully preserved uh, through this public hearing, through the next public hearing, and then with the district court. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. And the reason I, I wanted to just touch on that is because, as you said earlier, the number that we see in front of us today is an estimate. It's, it's not real. We haven't gone to bid. So once we get our bids back, um, then we'll actually have more accurate data to talk through with respect to the assessments because, I mean, it's clear the roadway needs to be addressed. You, you and I and Gary spent <laughs> some time uh, visiting with some of the neighbors uh, in this neighborhood along with the mayor. And I mean, it's very evident that it needs to happen. But I, I just wanted to make sure people understood the process as it relates to kind of what are we seeing tonight? When, what are we gonna see after um, the project gets authorized tonight uh, with regard to real numbers versus just estimated numbers. And I really like the idea that this will be the last time we have to do this for hopefully 40 years or so uh, because we're implementing that, that mill and overlay. That, I mean, that's such a game changer for us as a community, such a great idea. Uh, I don't have anything further, Mayor, thanks. Okay. Council, any other questions for staff at this point? All right, thank you, Ryan. So this is a public hearing, so I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing, and this is the opportunity for anybody who wants to speak on this item. Uh, if you do, you just got to go up to the podium and state your name and address for the record, and uh, you have up to three minutes to uh, uh, share with the council your thoughts. Anybody at all? Yes, sir, go ahead. Um. This is something kind of new to me. I, I haven't uh, encountered this before where I, as a homeowner, uh, are, are facing being assessed an extra cost above what our, my property taxes are. And I'm a little concerned about it, I guess. Uh, this The way that our economy has been here recently with everything going up so much higher, and some of us are on fixed incomes. and for us to be facing additional costs. I mean, for me, I just live pretty much from paycheck to paycheck and to, to face this going uh, where I'm gonna have to bear this burden uh, to, uh, it, it's a little bit concerning to me, I guess. Um, and so uh, if, if there was any possibility of delaying this or if there's some way that uh, you could help out some of us who are older and living on, on fixed incomes, uh, uh, it would just be helpful, I guess. So I, I can't say that I'm very excited about this. It's, uh, so I hope there's a way that you can kind of help some of us out that are facing uh, this situation. Sir, can I get you, though, to state your name and address? Name and address? Name and address. Name and address. Yeah. Earl Carsicus, uh 8257 Hyde Avenue South. Okay, and, and what I would just share uh, before if anybody else wants to come up is I would encourage you to actually reach out to our, our um, finance department uh, here at, at City Hall. Uh, they'd be more than happy to give you some of the options. I know Ryan touched on a couple uh, during, the, during his uh, presentation to us on different options that might be available to you uh, from either deferments or, or certain situations like that. We do have no, multiple neighborhoods over the years that we've done where uh, residents have had that uh, either their their assessment deferred or things to to help with that process. So there is definitely some opportunities out there, and and believe me, as somebody as I know, uh, Councilmember Dennis shared um, uh, my neighborhood many years ago uh, was uh, was done, and that was an expensive one. <laughs> and the one thing I'll just share with you is prior to me moving into my neighborhood, I just I'll share real quick for you. Um, there was kind of an uproar. Uh, in that area about being, you know, having their roads done. And they were just going to do a mill and overlay. And by the time, uh, the council at that time agreed and said, okay, we won't do it then. And then I move in, not just because of me, but I happen to move in. And a, and a couple of years later, the city comes back and says, the roads are now need to be completely done. And it jumped the price up by thousands and thousands of dollars that we were assessed because um, pushing the can down the road even during uh, certain economic times does make the, the pavement worse uh, and it actually makes the, the base worse, it makes the, uh, the uh, curbs worse. And so I just, I share that with you because I, I totally understand because there's always, it's unknown, especially this year right now with what's going on with interest rates and the economy and such, totally understand that, but I would assure you that um, we're going to be careful, and we always have been, uh, with our understanding of what this process is should it go forward. 
but please do call um, our office here at City Hall, and we can we can walk through some options for you. Yeah, I guess for me this is the first time I've encountered this, and to me I just I can't help but wonder why it is that individual homeowners are assessed when it's just not something that the city takes care of through our taxes. You know that we, and I know that from what I understand, this is a common procedure that everybody yes. does, but yeah. I. It just, to me, it doesn't seem quite right. But. Well, I guess it, it, it's a great question, by the way. Uh, each city does their percentages a little different. Some require the homeowners to pay 100%. Uh, some pay a little bit less. But I also would share with you that if we did your neighborhood or any other neighborhood within the, commu within the community of Cottage Grove, and let's say that the city picked up the entire cost, then everybody is being born. Uh, everybody is going to be paying for that. So um, the thought process has been uh, by payment management task force is that a certain percentage of the road um, I may not drive down your street and so a certain percentage of it I'm going to pay for to keep the standards up within the city and the and the maintenance the rest of it would be borne by the the individual homeowners that are actually use that street on a more consistent basis and so that's kind of the thought process behind it the percentages though it's really up to um, each city to kind of make it but again I do know that there are some cities not very far from here um, that actually assess up to 100% of the cost of the road in front of their house to be borne by the homeowners. And then the main thoroughfares in that are borne by everybody. If you take the time to call, sir, um, even if you call down to Public Works, Ryan can maybe do a better job than, uh, than we can explaining how the um, special benefit process works because there is value in this project that contributes to the overall value of the neighborhood and the, the homes in that neighborhood. And that's why we do the um, benefit assessment prior to even going to bid uh, to make sure that there's actually a quantifiable benefit to the homeowner. So um, that's something that he knows a lot more about than we do and can probably answer far more questions. But um, rest assured that these kinds of projects, even though they're not what I like to call the, the flashy stuff, um, they really do contribute to you know, greater value in your home, greater value to the neighborhood, greater value to the assets in the city. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Was there anybody else that would like to speak uh, during the public hearing? All right. Seeing none, I guess I'll go. Oh, yes. Would you like to speak? <clears throat> And again, if you just state your name and address for the record, please. I'm Susan Evans. I live on 8042 Hornell Avenue South. Um, I don't meet the any of the guidelines for the that would qualify for a special assessment. Um, but I just wanted to clarify. So that I wish I could go back a few slides, but that four thousand nine hundred something total assessment that is the total amount that we anticipate each homeowner. Paying, correct? The, Not, yeah, whatever the exact, well, it's, it is an estimate right now, but yes, the answer would be yes. Okay. So, I mean, I, again, I don't qualify for a special assessment like perhaps my neighbor here would, uh, but I do want to express the same sentiment that, again, in a recession, I just don't have the ability to pay $5,000 to to upkeep the road. I mean, I do agree that the roads need to be fixed. I would just like to, like he said, postpone it a year or two or something. Um, just because, again, we are considered to be in a recession and it's just monetary wise, it's just not something that, if I had $5,000, I wouldn't be using it to, to repay the road. Um, but I just wanted to express that sentiment as well as a, homeowner and a resident of Cottage Grove. No, I appreciate that. The, the one thing I will say, Joel, just so you're aware, um, because I know you mentioned that number a couple times now, um, if it, it, whatever the final number comes back at, um, that amount, uh, as, as Ryan has uh, mentioned in his presentation, you can pay a certain amount of money at that time, or what happens, just like any other type of assessment, that assessment will then go on to um, the, co the county, I'll say the county, tax roll, I guess, is the, uh, the best way to put it. So it would be every year when you pay, 
your, however you do it, through your mortgage or individual. So when you pay your uh, taxes that cover the city, the, the county, and the and, um, school district, um, and a couple others, uh, then that, that would be tied into that. So you, you would have, as Ryan was saying, you would have a, uh, a separate uh, taxable amount that's on yours that's going to pay off that, that road. But you do not need to come up with whatever that final number will be at the end of the year. Um, it's just the option that we do hear from some of our citizens sometimes. They want to pay some of it down. Um, and we, so we do that option. Um, and then in other cases, people just say, I'll just put it on the tax, on my taxes. It'll just roll over there if you don't do anything with it. And then it just becomes your part of your yearly tax bill, if you will, uh, that you get out uh, from the county uh, that uh, that portion will go to pay off the debt. And for the, because I know that a lot of, I wish I could see the slides, but like some of the money will also be going to um, fix the sewer lines and and whatnot, but will homeowners be made aware if their particular street or area is being, if their sewer lines are going to be worked on or if their utility lights are going to be fixed or corrected? Because we're all getting assessed equally, but will our, our sewer lines or our utility lines also be updated? Ryan, do you, do you, all right, what, what, what do we do this? Um, if there's any other questions, I'll let you do that. And then once we get, if there's anybody else who wants to speak, then I'll maybe have uh, Ryan come back up. I won't close the public hearing. I'll have Ryan come up and answer some of these questions. And then uh, if there's other additional questions by the public, we can obviously let you come back up and speak. Okay. okay? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, folks. Appreciate it. I'm um, Jalen Case. I'm at 8290 Hemingway. Appreciate the time today. Um, I had a couple questions, a short and sweet, if it's all right with you guys. Oh. Um, when it comes to, obviously, upgrading our systems, we understand the need for that. But I would like to understand, as a new homeowner, first-time homeowner coming into Cottage Grove, um, I've had family lived here for many, many years, and it's kind of a heritage that I want to continue. Uh, with that being said, is what I brought into consideration was my taxes and where they're at, where they stood. And coming into just buying this home two years ago, I was uh, smart and decided to get moved, married, new jobs, married, just had a kid literally two days ago type of thing. Oh, congratulations. And, uh, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate <laughs> it's it. It's awesome. Uh, but what it comes to me is, is some of the financial burdens behind that. After this project, what is the plan of attack for will my taxes rise based off of the improvements, and then now I have to pay more taxes on top of that. Could you guys elaborate more on that if that's the case? Yep, we can we can do that. Um, I don't know, Jennifer, do you want to take that one when we get to it? Or, okay. Did you have another question, though? I got three more. Yeah, no, let's go ahead. That's why we'll do it. Sure. Um, and then on, outside of that, I also plan on bringing in, um, doing a home remodel, full home remodel. Um, actually halfway through that. So with that, I plan on the attack to have a new driveway with also that is I need curb. Uh, so I'd like to know a little bit more on the process of how do we determine on the 15% that needed the curb replacement? Is that public knowledge? And then also the explanation of why those were children versus not. And then on top of the apron behind that too, is that public knowledge? Great. Yeah, good, good question. We'll be it able is. to answer that. And yeah. Ryan can help you with yep. it. Awesome. Yep. Ryan, you're going to become my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys are going to get real tight. Probably. Yep. Uh, yeah, just, and then outside, um, so I'll talk with Ryan outside of that too. Ryan, and maybe if I can address him yeah. too, are we able to set, I don't want to take everybody's time, but are we able to set up one-off appointments to have more thorough discussion on this? I'm a numbers geek, so that would be fantastic. A hundred percent, yes. Okay. Yeah, matter of fact, I will just share with you as they get, the project starts, you know, should it move forward. Okay. Um, there'll actually be neighborhood meetings and there'll be a construction project manager that will be in direct contact. I believe we've done websites too or, or um, a mail version or something. There was something that we do to try to keep the, the public aware. So like you would know when we're in your, uh, when they're in your neighborhood Perfect. or, you know, like I, I know exactly, I'm just going to say this in advance. I'll let Ryan talk about it, but uh, you can absolutely coordinate if you decide that you want your driveway done so it doesn't happen at the same time as the road and that yeah. you don't cut your driveway. If we're in it, we're in it. I don't yes. want to do something. Yeah, 100% yeah. agree with you. Yeah, okay. 
And then last thing too, um, is there, this is kind of a little bit off topic too, but is there a way um, to utilize technology? I travel for a living uh, through many states. Is there a way to leverage um, maybe Zoom or some virtual platform to get access to these type of meetings as well too? This is totally off topic, but just curious. The answer is, well, I'll, I'll leave that for our administrator to speak to, but we do, I mean, this meeting is live. Okay. Uh, it's, it is streaming right now. It is, okay, yep. perfect. Uh, now, can Knowledge you... to me, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. Um, but can you communicate through the to us through that process at this point? No. No, okay. Um, but yes, you can watch the meetings live anywhere. Gotcha. Thank or, you. or reruns. <laughs> perfect. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Before you it. sit yeah. down, I have a question for you. Yeah, sure. What's your last name? Case, C-A-S-E. Okay, so are you related to Craig, Gary, and that whole family? Uh, Gary's my grandfather. Okay, so are, did you move into his house? I did. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. Yep, I used to work with the G-Man, and Craig is a dear friend of mine, so yep. if you need anything at all, just call me. Okay? I appreciate that. I need uh, some of the potholes in front of my house fixed. So well, yeah. they're going to get <laughs> fixed with this. I, I, know, I know people. I know people. Yep. Yep. You got her. Okay, was there any... Oh, uh, a council member, Kambada. It is also worth noting that uh, for anyone who is going to be, knows they're going to be absent for any of those meetings, uh, you can submit questions or comments in advance mm -hmm. to our staff, and they'll make sure that those are become part of the record at the meeting. Yes. Uh, anybody else that wants to speak this evening? Hello, Bonnie Matter, 6649 Inskip Avenue South. And I just have a question. Um, as they do projects like this throughout the city, are they looking at bringing in like fiber cable, you know, burying the internet stuff so that we have access to high speed? Gosh, I wish I could. I, I'd, I'd love to say yes, because <laughs> I would love to have that in my neighborhood too, to be quite honest with you. Um, but I don't believe that that is the case. I can speak to that as part of the Cable Commission, and Dave also has this information. Um, <clears throat> the governor in his budget has authorized uh, a significant sum of money for accessibility, and even though that's predominantly for outstate communities that frankly have nothing right now, um, at our uh, Cable Commission meeting the other night, which is South Washington County Cable Commission, uh, where we deal with Comcast and all those other folks. Um, one of the conversation pieces was connectivity. And um, in two weeks, the uh, Minnesota State lobbying group for all of these various cable commissions will be at the Capitol, and they will be lobbying for exactly what you just talked about. Um, becomes ever more important as more and more people work from home or... Um, do schooling from home, et cetera. And that connectivity piece is a, is a really critical element to being successful moving through the remainder of this century. So it's a good question, and it's definitely something that's on, uh, you know, the Cable Commission's radar, many of our legislators' radar, et cetera. Okay. Anybody else want to speak? And then I'll... Ryan, do you want to start with your couple, and then I'll go to our administrator? <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, so one of the questions related to the project uh, regarding the sewer lines, you know, I mentioned the utility work that's being done, and is that, you know, whose is being fixed? And really what that is, is it's the sewer mains uh, throughout the neighborhood, the water mains throughout the neighborhood. So you know, they carry all the sewage out, and they bring all the water through it. So there might not be a, a sewer fixed right in front of your house, but it might be 10 houses down, and, you know, the sewage flows downhill. So it is a, a benefit throughout the entire neighborhood because you got to make those operate and water mains too all the water mains are looped um, so that system needs to operate as a whole if we're replacing valves or bolts or have any you know leaking water mains so um, it is spotty like I said it's not an entire replacement of utilities but that's a very expensive project and something we don't take lightly and and you really need a very poor condition to do that work uh, some of the other questions about more of the specifics and the scheduling um, we will have a if the project moves ahead, we'll have a, a pre-construction neighborhood meeting. Uh, usually have that about a month or so before the project starts, after we get bids, 
and a project is awarded. Um, at that meeting, we'll really get into schedule. Is the project gonna be phased and what's that look like? Uh, we'll also have our inspector there. There's a dedicated inspector for this project. Uh, we have hotline phone numbers that go directly to them and emails. Um, and they can be, they're really our, our liaison, not only they're inspecting the project, but they're working with all the residents during the project. Um, whether you're doing work, you have a, a driveway. So certainly if there's some curb work to be done, we'll coordinate that, right? So we don't want to cut into a new driveway. Um, or if there's a wedding or a graduation, we work really well with that. Um, I do want to add that the roadways are open during construction. So it's, uh, you know, really unless we're paving in front of the house or have some curb work, right, where you can't drive over that curb, um, there really is good accessibility during the project. Um, and in terms of kind of setting up separate appointments, uh, whether it's about the numbers, we're happy to talk with uh, anyone in the neighborhood. Um, they can reach out to either myself or our city engineer. Amanda Meyer, and we can talk through all that information on you know, what goes into the numbers in the project. And in terms of the actual inspector, when it comes to the project, we're very happy to do one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, if there's specific questions about construction as well. Um, and then uh, I guess the yeah, last question you answered that was about Zoom and the technology. Yeah, and it, it, just to say to the gentleman that was asking, I do know that when, when they go through neighborhoods, they will mark. Uh, they, you, you'll probably know if it's in front of your house because uh, it'll either be sinking or severely cracked, and they'll mark it with a big X uh, to note that that is going to be the one that they're going to they're going to take out or a section of it that they're going to take out. Yep. Um, and then obviously the the filling on the backside of it is is actually with I'll say better soil um, and and seed hydro seed. Yep. Just so you know that. And I should have added that. Yes, thank you, nope. Mayor. Oh, you're that, good. That, That's that why is, I figured. <laughs> yep, that, that is probably, and what we look at for that, just so people know, it, it's really, you know, settled, settled curb or very defective, you know, really busted apart, something that's going to reduce the life of the roadway um, is what we're looking at for that replacement. And then uh, our administrator, uh, Jennifer Levitt. Yes, Mayor and members of the council, I have to say, uh, I wish all of our residents would engage us as much as Mr. Case because that's how we can make projects be successful and answer those questions and have the information up front. Now, when it comes to the taxes, the one thing that I will tell you up front is we don't notify Washington County that we're improving the roads, so we don't provide no. a notice to the assessor's office that we're doing it. So you're not going to see a direct impact from our work but I will tell you your remodeling project could have an effect on your um, uh, assessed value um, after that. Um, the one thing I know Ryan uh, maybe just touched on briefly, but he also indicated, you know, how did we determine that? Um, that's actually by us actually walking every linear foot of curb um, in the neighborhood to determine that, and we have an assessment tool that evaluates, as Ryan said, um, which curb will be replaced. Now the key thing, too, is for a project to be successful, it takes engagement. And so we really encourage residents to reach out to us. As Ryan said, we don't want to ruin your graduation, your wedding, um, your grad sale, or any of those things. So, um, and especially if you're making a financial investment in your driveway, um, yes, we don't want to come and cut a, a nice line across your brand new driveway um, and rip it out. So we want to coordinate that with you and make it be successful. We want this to be a lasting value and really enhance your property at the end of the day. And we really work, too, to on the communication side of things to make sure with our neighborhood meetings, our letters, our email listservs, our websites, making sure all of our meeting minutes um, and presentations are, are presented. So hopefully people can find the information that they need, and we work really hard to ensure a successful project for everybody. Okay. Was there anybody that had additional questions on this particular item? Okay. Uh, seeing none, I will go ahead then and go and close the public hearing. And then council, unless there's questions for staff. Mayor, I'll move that we adopt resolution 2023-018 ordering the 2023 pavement management project and authorizing preparation of plans and specifications. Second. Okay, so I have a, a, a motion by Council Member Olson, second by Council Member Thede. Okay, any further discussions? Again, the only comment I'd mention, as I mentioned earlier, uh, like with you, sir, too, is if you have any questions about any of this, the assessment process or anything like that, please uh, reach out to us. You can even go through the council if you sure. want, yep. but we'll get you in contact with one of our staff members to make sure you're aware of, of how this will all go. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Council Member Kambata. Somebody who has lived in several homes and had several assessments, I, uh, I can empathize with the, the, like the heartburn of like getting the assessment. 
Uh, and in my time on planning commission and up here, you know, I really wish we had a crystal ball and we could be like, we could know when asphalt's gonna be the cheapest and when interest rates are gonna be the cheapest, but you know, it would have not made any sense at all to, to do this project five years ago it, when it had five years of useful life left in it. So especially with these infra infrastructure projects, it's, um, it's frustrating at least as a council member to, to know that like some of these things just have to happen when they happen. And we have to do our due diligence to try and get the best outcome for our, for our constituents. Um, but again, I do empathize that, uh, that this neighborhood got their card pulled this year to, to do this. And, you know, every, every year it's frustrating because a couple of years ago, asphalt was cheap, you know. Um, so that's my two cents is it's a, it's a difficult but necessary decision to make. Okay. So one that, that I, I definitely take seriously. All right. Seeing no other comments by council, all, uh, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all for coming this evening. All right, uh, next uh, 10 is bid awards. There are none this evening. Uh, 11 is regular agenda. There are no uh, regular agenda items this evening. Uh, 12 is council comments to request. So we'll start with uh, council member Kambata. I will yield my time to council member Dennis. <laughs> All right, <laughs> then I guess I'll go to uh, council member Dennis. All right, thank you, Mayor. I just uh, wanted to take a moment to um, recognize the uh, state of the city address that you did. Uh, did a fantastic job of sharing a lot of great information about our community, um, the vibrant nature, the fact that we're growing, the fact that we're successful, and the fact that we work hard, as you indicated, to uh, provide and sell happiness as, as much as we possibly can here. So very nice job on that, and, um, and whoever may have helped you to put that uh, material together it was pretty substantial. And uh, was that Eric? Was Eric that helped, absolutely. Right. Nice, nice work, Eric. And... Uh, uh, just, just really um, a great statement on behalf of of how much our community is being successful. So nice thank, work. Thank, thank you. you. All right, Councilmember Thede. I'm good. All right, Councilmember Olson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, earlier this evening, you all had the opportunity to see a check presentation from the Public Safety Board to the City of Cottage Grove to help offset the costs of our new canine. And of course, we're very grateful to the Public Safety Board for that donation and frankly, for all that they do. Um, one thing that I wanna note with regard to that body is that they also manage the Craig Woolery Scholarship, which is awarded each year to a recipient or multiple recipients uh, who reside in the community and are desirous of a career in public safety, whether that be police, fire, or EMS. Um, generally, we have a check presentation, um, you know, sometime around the first week of March. I'm not quite sure if that's how we're going to do it again this year or not, uh, because, um, frankly, uh, you know, Ch Chief Willery's a busy guy, so we keep calling him to meetings to come and, and accept the check. But um, that scholarship's very important to me and, and my wife. We, uh, we founded that scholarship in Craig's name, uh, Chief Willery's name, for the reasons as articulated earlier um, to really help support young people who wanna get into a public safety career. So if you are interested in helping those young people as well, you have the opportunity to contribute towards that scholarship fund. And you can do so by reaching out to any of our council members, um, reaching out to anybody at, at City Hall, but really it's the Public Safety Board who is managing that for us. So. Um, if you would like to put a few dollars towards the Craig Woolery Scholarship, um, please give that some consideration. There's a lot more information on the Public Safety Board's Facebook page. Um, we also have a link to the Public Safety Board on our website. And then, um, you know, tell people that you know who have, you know, young folks, high school age, who are looking to go to college and pursue a career in law enforcement or as a firefighter or as a EMT or as a medic, that this is an opportunity that exists. They will be awarding this scholarship in May for this year's recipients. So uh, to get 
really into the application process sooner would be better. And for those kids at Park High School who might have some interest in that, um, they can speak to any one of the counselors. I know um, Mr. Powers in particular uh, is, is very good about sharing that information with people. But, um, you know, it's getting to be that time of year, even though it's January, February today, and it's cold outside that, um, you know, we're going to start seeing kids thinking about graduating before you know it. And getting a hold of those scholarship forms early would be a good thing. And then the second thing that I had to add is today is February 1st. February, as uh, we do every year, we celebrate Black History Month. And um, there will be uh, some more information with regard to um, th this month's council comments and council update video um, to dig a little deeper into Black History Month. But I just want to, uh, first of all, thank everybody who makes our community home, regardless of their you know, race, color, creed, et cetera. But um, we certainly are seeing an increase in our percentage of residents who are people of color. And we want everybody in this community to feel welcome. Um, you know, it seems like every month is something month. But, um, you know, we want people to know that we're here for you. When you move to the city of Cottage Grove, you are in our care. And we take that very seriously. And all are welcome here. All are welcome here. And if you don't feel welcome, we want to know it. Because that's not the way that we want this community to operate. So enjoy Black History Month. Let your young people know about the Woolery Scholarship if that's something they might want to take advantage of. And with that, Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you, uh, Councilmember Olson. Uh, so first of all, thank you all for uh, joining uh, uh, me and a couple of people are still in the audience tonight that joined uh, me at the State of the City Address. Uh, very honored to uh, be able to talk about all the exciting things that have happened in the past uh, years within the City of Cottage Grove, specifically we focused on last year and then a lot of things that are happening as we move forward into uh, 2023 and frankly beyond. Uh, a lot of things that I still weren't able to talk about that I so want to, uh, but uh, we got to make sure things uh, kind of work their way through. Um, I did, I, I did want to mention to the public, I happened to see earlier today, uh, we had put out a posting, uh, city posting. So we do, we love to communicate in a variety of different uh, ways uh, to the citizens of Cottage Grove, whether it's State of the Cities, Facebook, you know, Twitter, Instagram, all those kind of things, uh, newsletters and such. Um, there was a, a posting out there to talk about um, Glacial Valley Park. And it was interesting, some people that don't know where Glacial Valley Park was, uh, and I noticed this on the Facebook posting, um, we're Googling it or trying to find it, and for whatever reason, it showed up that the ping shows that Glacial Valley Park is in Woodbury. Yeah. And so I know that we're working, our staff is working with uh, Google and such on Google Maps to make sure that they realize that there is Glacial Valley Park is in Cottage Grove, and it's actually just off of the New Ravine Parkway and County Road 19. It is uh, a significantly, it's our first, uh, and I mentioned this in our um, I State of the City, it's the first uh, large park that we've built in Cottage Grove in over 20 years. Um, the, the reason it may be pinging, if you will, in Woodbury is because this area has a huge amount of open space and prairie grass, and we're working with um, the Washington County and the Watershed District and everybody, and where you can literally take, jump on a trail in Cottage Grove and you can work your way into Woodbury and past Woodbury. Frankly, at some point in time, you'll, you could ride a bike or walk all the way up to Lake Elmo Park Reserve on the trail system. Uh, so Glacial Valley Park, there is a version of it that's in Woodbury, that's with the city of Woodbury that they're doing, and then they have Cottage Grove's part of Glacial Valley Park. So for the public that may be, why are you building a pavilion and all this stuff in Woodbury? It's not being built in Woodbury, it's being built in Cottage Grove. Now Woodbury will have all their stuff on their end. I will tell you, I do know there is a plan for some interpretive uh, informational uh, booths or such that are gonna be right on the border between the cities of Cottage Grove and Woodbury. Uh, but all of the facilities that we were talking about and that you may be seeing about um, are actually in the city of Cottage Grove. So I thought I would just uh, mention that for the public. Um, so next, uh, seeing no other council comments or requests, I did want to mention to the public, we do have uh, one uh, workshop which is open to the public. And I thought I would just share with everybody is that we will be as a council adjourning uh, to the training room uh, for the public safety team to provide our annual response to resistance overview. Uh, this annual review is a, sta a standard for our city, and it is a protocol that updates the council on whatever the national uh, best practices are used by our officers following, uh, or off that our, follow our officers follow, excuse me, uh, when responding to service calls. So 
As many people in this audience and maybe out there know, uh, the city of Cottage Grove is uh, with Woodbury, again, interestingly enough, uh, built this great facility next to us uh, for uh, training of our public safety personnel and fire. And uh, what we're going, doing right now is to hear what some of the updates are uh, as they do every year for us, just to give us an idea of what are some of the things that um, the training or the new things that they're doing uh, to share with the city of Cottage Grove and the council on uh, ways of, of managing uh, situations that may arise within the city. So uh, with that, uh, we do not have a workshop that's closed to the public. So again, uh, if th for everybody that came, thank you. Uh, otherwise, we will be uh, moving to the training room. Have a good night.